Welcome everybody. Uh, we have yet another Friday seminar and I'm happy to present uh, our next speaker he, uh, from CSIRO, uh, Andreas Wunsch. Uh, and um, uh, he completed his uh, undergraduate uh, degree in uh, chemical engineering at the Monash University in uh, 2007 and worked in many different industries from manufacturing pulp and paper, water treatment, to ion exchange mineral recovery. Before joining it at uh, CSIRO in 2006 as a senior research engineer, primarily for his uh, process scale up uh, expertise. He broadened his skills uh, into technical economic and value engineering fields and became a project lead, uh, leader of uh, large uh, flagship, uh, flagship projects uh, over one million and formed a team based on technical economic and process development. He completed his uh, Master's of Business Administration at Deakin University in 2010 and uh, since uh, 2011 he was appointed uh, group leader currently heading the unit operation and uh, process design group in a mineral uh, resource flagship while uh, still being a project uh, manager of Amara uh, P. Uh, 10 uh, 7 for integrated tailings management uh, project. Uh, Andreas, welcome and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, yeah, for all my sins, I think the MBA was uh, actually quite useful to, to handle all the change that a lot of the organisations are going through. And I suppose today what we're going to be talking about is. Um, the journey, I suppose, where CSIRO nowadays sits. So we've changed a lot, probably in the last 18 months, as an organisation, had to. Um, but also, really, the, today's talk is really about showcasing some of the capabilities that we have. And as I go through this presentation, it's going to go at a fairly rapid pace, because I'd like to just give people a taste for the type of things that my group in particular can offer. Just keep in mind, this is just my group of about 30 people. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of things that we can offer um, from a collaboration point of view. So, you know, there's a lot of nice what call them, toys, there's a lot of nice equipment in there. Um, and there are ways of nowadays using that equipment and actually sharing um, some of the facilities and some of the um, techniques and um, um, things that we've developed over time. So with that, I'll start just a very quick background on, on CSIRO. Everybody's probably here, heard of CSIRO. But essentially, um, we're still an organisation of about 5,000 people. Um, 18 months ago, that probably would have been more like six and a half. And there's progressive downsizing in the organisation. We'll probably, my guess is, end up probably around about 4,500 people or up. Um, now keep in mind, we've got quite a few sites in the end to reduce our footprint. We used to have, I think, 58 sites, we're now 52. I think the target roughly and that quote was probably somewhere around about 50. So there's a conciliation process going on and I'm actually part of one of the conciliation processes where we're moving higher to Melbourne over into Clayton and moving the equipment across. Um, having said that, a lot of the equipment is actually moved across, so just because we're closing the site doesn't necessarily mean that we stop working that field. Um, it's actually a good opportunity to throw out a lot of the legacy things that have been around for 50 years and people actually knew how to use it and were there. Um, of course, the next week we discover used to need it. But uh, it's more of those things that you know, gives you an opportunity to rebuild some things and actually you know, make sure things can flow with the current regulations, etc. that you're not still not being simple. We have flagships, and I'll talk about those in a moment. There's nine of those in very distinct groups. Um, and we used to have a matrix system where, in theory, you could have anybody and anywhere working on your project. So if I were an astronomer on my project, I could have actually pulled it up from parks. Um, we've now gone a little bit more back to um, core areas. So None of them have been very close related to energy, for instance. We still have a budget, is around about well, 1.2 billion, it's probably a number. So we, we still have a sizable amount of money. Um, a lot of that comes in from the government as a pro. Um, uh, in some divisions, like my division, it's, it's about a 50 50 split. Um, but that means that you can only really leverage that other 50% if you basically have some industry partner or somebody actually with you. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. It's, it's good to have that, and it's to some degree 
with the same complaint, but at the same time, if you only get in the approved money, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can just run off the price. It doesn't quite work that way. Um, so yeah, we have some smart people, 64% of them um, hold university degrees, and uh, you know, we have two, over 2,000 doctorates, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I think the biggest driver really is on how do we engage with younger students coming up. And we have increasingly more so established and really strong connections with more universities. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on CSIRA. It's not supposed to be a plug for CSIRA, so I'll get over this very quickly. But essentially, we have a couple of roles. All I'm trying to illustrate with that slide is that we have a number of calls that we need to juggle. So we can't only be a consultancy firm that goes out, particularly in mineral areas, very tempting just to do consulting work, and maybe it's a problem to go out and actually do this. But we have an overlay that technically we are government, we're seen as independent, we're meant to lead in the motion, um, rightly or wrongly, uh, and we're meant to do it in such a way that we have a long horizon, which causes a problem then if you try and get you know, people to actually invest into your projects. If you tell them you have to make it seven to ten years' time, people tend not to want to invest in those straight away. And also there's a, some sort of caretaker role as well to help SMEs, smaller companies, we have a program where we embed scientists into organisations for a period of time at a heavily discounted rate to help small companies build up expertise in a whole range of areas, not only in those mining. And then of course, last but not least, is to actually do some science. Again, I'm not going to go through these in any sort of detail. Um, if anybody wants a presentation at the end, whatever, I'm happy to put it in and do another week anyway. But um, it's the last one really that I want to be talking about, that last circle there and really trying to drive home that collaborative approach. So a lot of the work now that we did in the past used to be we would try and actually hold on to these things pretty much within CSIRO. If we really, really were pushed, we would try and get an external person in or we would basically support something again or you know, gradually do a collaboration. That has very much changed. Um, I think the process of downsizing, the process of actually readjusting what we do has now made us have to look at how do we fill certain capability gaps that have now developed. There are certain areas that we don't do any work in. I mean, it's it's no, no secret that we don't do a lot of work in the for instance. Right? That's an area we don't do, something that JOK does. So it's one of these things where if we can identify people who can actually help us with a problem, we will go out and search for yeah, the best people who want to actually do that and pay them for it. Um, it's not that we expect that for nothing. And in the case of the projects that I've led, um, in the past, this has got me into trouble where, you know, essentially half the money that's walking into us would walk back out again. Um, you know, and it causes angst for staff because, like, why aren't you employing me? Why are you hiring some guy from Prague or wherever? Um, but it does give you the ability to actually pick out selected people and bring in new ideas and new expertise. And I think it's one of those things that if we're going to be forward looking, um, we cannot pretend that we can cover the entire value chain of the process. Again, there's something that's called partnering for impact. CSIRO loves the word impact, um, and I think actually do believe in impact. I think if what we do actually doesn't actually have an outcome, um, there's really why we're doing it. Um, yes, it may lead to something one day, but unless you've got some clear path of how you're actually going to commercialise it, how you're going to get it out there and how you're actually going to work with somebody to actually get it to, to an organisation, why are we doing it? And there's some Obviously, we are meant to be the strong focused industry, the I and CSRO industrial. The whole point is that you know, we take the fundamental and try and pull it out into industry. But I think it's bigger than that. It's also working by so heavily with the SMEs. And we spend a lot of time, you can see, this is not only from mineral sources, but from the whole SIRO. We have nearly 1,200 SMEs that we deal with, which all have their own, own, own problems, challenges. These are the kind of countries that we work in, and again, that's probably no different to any other uh, country in the world. Predominantly, all this falls back to people who speak English, but we are increasingly now working with China, India in particular, um, and more recently with our Centre of uh, Excellence in Chile, we're also doing some work in Latin America. Again, it's not supposed to be blood, move on. Um, these are the flashes that I was talking about. Flash is just a fancy name for a home of loosely associated like minded people. Um, that's the way I look at it. And they have different clients. So you look from a client base, and sometimes they overlap. So in the case of, a um, you know, good example I can give is we do work in auto sands, is that energy, is mining, is 
one of those ones that's a little bit of a grey area. But by and large, um, you know, we, we tend to help each other out. And I do quite a bit of work in manufacturing, for instance, because of my background. I still do quite a bit of work in energy, um, where we look at uh, some of the things in solar, um, how do we look at, you know, how do we look at integrating with mining. Um, but we also do work in land and water and tailing. So we do still work across the flagships. And there are certain quotas for managers in place that says, if you're not actually engaging with other flagships, or for that matter, other organisations, some very hard questions get asked. But today, basically, I'm going to be talking about the mineral resources one. So the mineral resources flagship used to be known as Minerals Down Under. Um, for that, well, it had multiple names, but they keep reinventing the name, but essentially the work that we do is, is pretty much the same. Some things get a little bit spin out, I think it's metal production. Is it metal production manufacturing or is it it's actually in, 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 in mineral processing that's in the most transit grey areas? And on the periphery they will make some changes to that life. But by and large, the mineral resources flagship is still the mineral resources flagship. What it has inherited is a lot of the old flagship used to be known as light metals. So a lot of light metals flagship um, rolled into this particular flagship, which is where I transit. There's two areas, particularly the improving productivity and driving environmental performance, which are for what I lead and the group that I work with as is absolutely critical. And these are the four areas that we want to really develop. Um, growing Australian natural resource base, that's more exploration. How do you look at, you know, um, doing analysis? How do you pull things out quickly so that you can say, okay, this is worthwhile doing, what's not worthwhile doing? Online sensing, in other words, source sorting, that type of thing. It's all, that's already borderline improving productivity, but still growing the resource base. And I'll talk about this in a moment, but essentially a lot of the work that we do, obviously we're spending taxpayers' money, our money. Um, we have to show that this is actually going back to Australia, which in the days now of things being multinational, and there are really no true Australian companies, I'll argue, um, it's very hard to say that, okay, if you're doing a collaboration with even BHP, we have to take your name um, is that really for the good of Australia or is it for the good of the company, is it for the good of the globe? So I think these things where we can say, oh, we're going to spend money now on things that actually like Australia, it, it is, is a problem because essentially this is an argument to made that every cent that you spend, ultimately how does it actually come back? We've targeted some impact areas across that value chain. Um, and again, this is pretty much what I alluded to before, but you know, exploration through clever, rapid resource characterisation, um, intelligent mining and ore management, which is the sensing and sorting, etc. Processing Australian ores. Again, the emphasis there, and this is the area that I sit in, processing Australian ores. It doesn't mean that the processing plant, smelter, you name it, is sitting in Australia, You're just processing Australian ores. So the idea is that you, know, you could be shipping iron ore off to China and we've got their blast furnace, but if it helps us sell more ore, or if it helps us with a problem with materials, then the still net benefit for Australia that makes us competitive. So again, it's, there's a lot of, the all these things, there's obviously a lot of people spend a lot of time on this, but there's a very strong emphasis on what is it that we're actually trying to do with the money that we've got. And one of those things is a price of productivity, and then really the two new ones is really the responsible mineral production, so this is going into more, more environmental areas, and positioning the resource and community, which is actually based up here in Portland Vale. These are not necessarily um, geographical groups but they tend to have a history. So Pullman Vale and Anna Little Voice um, program up there looks a lot of, you know, what's the impact of mining communities, social demographics, et cetera. So they, they're sort of the in, in part of this. And it comes back also to that social license to operate, which, which again, in Tatum, becomes something I'm interested in. So I'm gonna start drilling down a little bit, so we've taken a very high level of um, view and get to some of the toys in the moment. But the pricing of Australian laws, again, there's a project objective there around um, how do we deliver not only commercial outcomes but also environmental. So it comes back to that trusted advisor thing. So just because it's not necessarily commercial, we do have some influence on how some of the guidelines are set in regards to government and where government wants to be driving some of the behaviours in the minerals mining industry. So we sit on those panels and we do give them advice on what's doable, what's not doable. And by and large, we do that in consultation. But it's one of those roles where you know, we need to be engaged and we need to be relevant to, to, the, um, to not only the mining industry but also the general community and people around it. Under that process in Australia, there's um, three program groups um, 
is the Unit Operation Specialist Design Group, which, which I head up. There's a base in the Precious Metal Group, um, it sits in Waterford, so I, I'm Clayton. Um, in Melbourne, and uh, Waterford, Perth, there's the Precious Base, uh, base in the Precious Metals area. And then we have the Light Just Metals, which is more the um, how, what do we do with rare earths, what do we do with uh, mineral sands, etc. Um, maybe on the periphery of the uranium, etc. So there's, there's a you know, little bit more of a different area. So it's not based on precious metals, and it's not processing kind of things. Just to share some of the thinking, and this has changed a lot in some of the strategic direction that we're taking now. Um, and really, it's, it's, it's you know, some of these things are more mild statements, but if, if, I, if I'm talking to my guys, particularly when I'm encouraging to collaborate, one of the things that I do is, does it kind of, you know, any decision is, oh, should we do this work, or shouldn't we do this work, should I be investing in this, should this, or should I be investing into this? These are sort of the guiding principles that we kind of take around us. And, you know, the diversification of applications, so we want to have the depth in an area, but if it's so narrow, where can be applied? That A puts you in danger that if that area goes out of favour or doesn't get funded or else, that you can be the world's best expert in X, but if it doesn't have a very broad application or can't be applied very broadly, um, it'd be very good. <laughs> Otherwise, you would be in trouble if that area basically dries up. So the idea is to have the depth, but be able to actually roll it out so it's a bit broader than that, not just you know use for one little area. And I think uh, if, if it allows people, so if someone comes to me, can you fund this, can we do this? One of the things I say, okay, that's great, we can do that, but is it only applicable to this particular industry? Is it only applicable for bare earths, or is it, can it actually be uh, broad across the block for all of them? And so that's one of the questions that we'll ask ourselves. Challenging and stimulating research. So uh, again, coming back to that deep thing of, of what we actually do, understanding the modelling. So a lot of the work that we do is based around modelling, particularly in my group. So it's not good enough just to have a model that needs to be validated. Now, CD guys don't like the word validate, but it you know, has certain um, connotations. But it's a really, it's one of those things where it's literally you have the actual resources then to go out and actually make sure that what you're modeling actually reflects reality. The model I need to be just as far as I'm concerned. Um, and there's, there's a real danger that people think that this is the whole answer for everything and um, we need to have an insurance cycle. And it has to be a novel. So uh, there's no point modeling stuff or working on things that have been done to death, right? So you can do that and you can probably run better simulations, find a resolution, you can do a whole heap of stuff, but if it doesn't actually lead to any new, novel, something that actually creates some happiness that can get the impact, um, there's no point doing it. Um, collaboration connections, which is kind of why I'm here, is having a look at who has complementary skills, techniques, and things that we can actually work with. If, if, if we can't actually identify people who are really good at areas that we think, yeah, okay, that's really an area we're going to tap into. Because the majority of the people that work for me will not have the insight to know what you guys do here. Right, so my step is to actually come here and show you some of the things that we do in the group. I'm hoping at some stage, you know, Chris or someone else might come down and tell us some of the things that you guys do and get that sort of broader engagement, does it? Um, and as I said, we also see bulbs at common. So we will pay people into small companies, SMEs, etc. We will place people into um, vendor that make equipment. So you know, we'll have people in that. So we'll have people in, in various organisations around the world just to get that experience, but also to you know, um, get the interaction going of, well, what are your problems? Right? It's just something to sit around the table and just, as managers, you know, yeah, I think we've got a problem. There's it's nothing like actually being on site and seeing what the actual problem is. So getting people out there to actually visualise that as important. And we have mechanisms actually sending people off to do that. So we have funding available that's specifically designated for actually doing this type of work. And then awareness and position. Again, I shouldn't run here, but just basically say, look, this is what we do. These are some of the things that we've got, some of the instrumentation that we've got. These are some of the people. And increasingly I've been saying to people, if what you're doing isn't actually cutting edge benchmark work, ask yourself the question, why are we doing it? Why aren't we actually then just collaborating with people who are benchmark, who are the cutting edge? And that's been a process that we've been doing now for the yeah, in the last 18 months, and it's going to be an ongoing process. I can, you know, I can foresee that this is going to be probably for the next 18 months where we're going to go through this another process. Is this really cutting edge? And if it's not, we have science reviews, we have external reviews, and we get reviewed to death. But if, if, if the scientists themselves don't feel that what they're doing is actually cutting edge and they're not passionate, that's the other part of it, they're not 
passionate about it. They're only doing it just to keep themselves in the job. For <coughs> you know, it keeps you going for a little while, but you know they've got to actually expand that space. And surprise, surprise, those areas tend to actually run out of funding. <coughs> so it's, it's sort of natural evolution of things. But it's it's really you know having that conversation with people. You know, is this really what you're passionate about, or are you only doing this because you know you need to basically feed a family, which is good motivation? Um, it, it is a very good question because if you can't get that right, you can't get people passionate about what they're doing, or they identify what they're doing. A lot of people, believe it or not, people have been there for 10 years, never asked themselves that question. What am I actually passionate about? They can give them work to do, and somebody's always come along and said, here's your pile of work. But they never actually asked, well, is that actually what I'm really interested in? But anyway. So they're the type of things. So these are conversations that I have. I spent a little time on that slide, but I think it's important to understand why I'm here, why I talk with other people, other universities, um, you know, People were even within CSIRO, I'll basically pull this out. Our group's focus. So really, everything that we do is based on measurement, simulation, particularly of multi-phase flows, solid or separation processes. So it kind of fits into that space. That may not even necessarily be in minerals. Um, it fits into that space. That's a space that we want to be in. That's a space that we would like to be in home. Now, the reality we can never will. There are some core capabilities that I think which are really critical and what I'll do is the, the list that's here, essentially I'll be going through and showing you some pictures of what we actually do. But the CFD in particular, I think we, we're really proud of. Um, it was sitting out in the limb in the mathematical part department for quite a number of years where they were suddenly you know, doing CFD of all types of things. Um, and we still do. Like last week I reviewed a paper on brain aneurysms. We do CFD on that and it's like all um, but you know, we have some really well cutting guys that basically work in a whole range of different fields, but increasingly we're coming back to what's happening in multi-phase flows, solid approach systems. Um, flow analysis, um, pipe and valve erosion modeling, um, slurry, particularly non-Newtonian fluids. Um, we have a couple of people who are uh, world experts in that space and what happens in non-Newtonians, um, particularly when you start looking at paste of the containers. Um, so liquid handling, um, anything to do with uh, pickles, etc. That's, that's an area that we, we like to be in. Um, cyclones, you know, dewatering, consolidation, sedimentation, flocculation, sensors of polymers, flocculation, flotation, aggregation. And we have a team of water for who virtually just do that. Um, flotation, by and large, it's in plate at the moment, but uh, like I said, people need to change the Before I get into the next step of the drink. So I'm going to take you through this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these things, but I'm hoping that as I go through these, there's something that sparks your interest and we think there's something worth finding and that you'll come and see me after this, this presentation. So the fluids processing modeling team is about eight or so people. It varies. We also that's permanent staff who also have PhD um, students which we supervise and also postdocs which aren't counted in this, in this account, so these are researchers. Um, and we have a whole range of different software. Um, increasingly we're doing a lot more work with open phone. The power of that is just phenomenal. Um, just to give you an uh, anecdotal type um, idea, we used to model feed wells and thickness, which, um, let's just say, for, for modeling what we wanted to do with the population balance model, um, would take us sometimes up to three months to actually run on a simulation. Um, now with open phone, we can do these type of simulations that should open up because we can spread that load out over multiple um, uh, model of computers and uh, open phone being a open source um, platform. Um, there's actually no license for it, but you've got to develop all your routines. But uh, just to give you an idea, the things have moved on a lot, but having said that, we still do the majority of our work with, with ANSYS. Um, we develop with answers particular routines in the multi-phase area. So they come and seek us when they develop new um, new sections, new um, modules that they want to import in that area. They'll come and work with us to actually develop them as well, particularly in the mixing area. So there's a whole range of things there. I'm not going to pretend I know every single one of these packages intimately. It's not in my area, but if there's anything in there that actually tweaks the interest, um, Modern physics modeling, um, so again, very much industrial applications. So 
We have here is the high smelt production vessel. Um, we spend quite a bit of time on them that. Um, in particular, I get focused on the race flow, but high temperature, um, heat transfer, electric things like all those things are built into our model. So it's not purely the old CFD model, we're basically making our aerofoils and that type of stuff. We build in a lot of the chemistry, we build in a lot of the other work that people tend to just say it's outside of the bounds of what we normally do in CFD. And really, the research process is an example of a coal combustor. Um, I think that's a one tenth scale of the actual coal combustor that we have. Um, and basically what we look at there is now what's the effect of putting this coal at a wetter uh, percentage into this combustor and what's the effect going to be on the actual um, on the combustor and the fluid inside there, the heat distribution. And we have the ability of actually uh, developing those type of models. So that top one right here is here. Um, just to give you an idea of scale, it's hard to tell, but this is approximately uh, as it is about four metres. But it's a decent size. And the, it's made out of first thing, so we did a whole heap of laser work on it as well. So not only did we do the CFD, but it's mixed then in with and validated with, with laser uh, work and I'll talk about that a little bit more. I think one of the things that will come obvious in this, this type of presentation is that all these things are interlinked. So we rarely will do just one. We'll actually try and have at least two modes where we actually need to cross-check things. Hydronomous and flotation cells, we have a fairly large cell sitting um, in our lab. Cell, where we can do analysis, laser work, again it's um, translucent. And so we'll do the CFD model where the bubble flow, but we'll also do the laser work to actually see what actually happens in there. Um, and we've done work in the past where we would have compared probably three of the major ones. Um, bubble attachment, detachment models, we have a lot of expertise, not only in the flotation space, but even in, in areas, uh, particularly in solid extraction, etc., what happens with particles? Again, the CFD needs to actually be validated by the supervision. So we have a lot of work that goes on and what happens in that space. Um, fluidized beds in general is, is an um, area that we spend a lot of time in, high temperature fluidized beds in particular, and you know, some of the animation that goes around that. And again, we would uh, do a particular flow um, comparison is that we have traces. So we have a trace of um, slump of being based on what actually happened. And by and large, when we work with clients, we're really pretty happy with that. So this is through the barrel fluid approach. Um, again, coal, fluid ice beds, um, you know, there's a whole heap of things that you know, we can basically look at in, in regards to you know, how to actually tweak some of the parameters. Uh, what's the density of the bed, do some predictions, do you get bubble breakthrough, etc. Slumping, etc. So. Think in the feet well. Um, a lot of the work in that space came out of the P266 um, project in Myra. Um, but a lot of the work that we developed there, particularly putting together the full population balance um, distribution models, um, initially done in CFX, now in open fire. It's kind of the example I was talking about before. So the picture here is just the feet well. And you kind of see what's happening with uh, some of the issues. And let's just say some of the vendors use that information to actually redesign their own um, feed well designs and most of things. Here's another pretty picture of it. Uh, so this is the same set as our own number one, but since then, other people who were part of that project have basically developed their own. So this is now quite a problem. Again, there's a whole range of things I'm going there. Here's a small plug for a CFD conference that we're running down in Melbourne. Um, I'd recommend anybody who can make it down there to actually go to that. It's in Berlin, Australia, so it's going to be in the 7th or the 9th of December, but it covers a whole range of things, and Peter Witt, who heads up this, is actually running it. So this is Peter Witt. He's my team leader for fluids modeling. Um, and this is background. So I suggest that either contact through me, or if you want to contact Peter directly, um, the the guy basically does what he's Next section on process measurement and modeling. So CFD, again, it's great, but not so great if it's done purely in isolation. So it's the validation part of it. These are some of the things that we have um, as a list, and I'll take you through some of these in a bit more detail. Um, there's a lot of acronyms here, but you know, laser, Doppler, uh, energy, based Doppler, particle analyzer. We can do a lot of um, BIB type work, ultrasonics, um, 
everything virtually up to gamma attenuation. So we, we have laboratories where we can work with those old materials as well. And I think for me, actually, one of the exciting ones is actually the blood fraction program. We'll go through at the moment quite concerned. So this is one of our laser labs to give you an idea. We'll find there. Here we are. We'll pop the buses still sitting in the background. It's one of those things that we built that we can't actually take out of the lab. It's too big. Um, but you'll find there's like a salt extraction room. We have a small one that we're working with. Um, and, and a number of other places. So there's a number of things that we have that basically do laser slot. And we have some really good capability in that space. Here's another one where there's another laser lab. Again, in the background there is that, uh, the, the flotation cell. But we're one of the few places um, that can take a full size pop up electrode and actually see what happens to the formation of the surface. So we had a particular client who wanted to know what, how, how the electromedium would pop on. Quite a bit of time looking at how we can do that. It's what's even on the side by side. Yeah, we'll get Void fraction system um, in particular seems like a fairly simple process, but can actually be quite powerful with regards to actually working out where your phases are. And in particular, one of the areas that we're looking is particularly good in actually working out where your foam interfaces are. So whether that be solid extraction, whether that be flotation. Um, it actually gives you a fairly good picture, I think, of the slide on that. Yeah, a bit later, come back to that. Um, that basically shows that you can actually profile a cross section of a flotation cell or solid construction of the matter um, and work out what your blood pressure is all the way from, all the way from the air, all the way down to the pulp, and work out where your levels are. So, working out the level of the pulp, by and large, not so much of an issue, working out how much of a front way you've got, um, and reliably actually quantify. Part of the vision microscope, well, so it's just too much of this scope. But the other thing I should mention about this is that while we have a lot of the equipment that actually sits inside the lab, um, virtually all of the equipment that we've got, we've also got a version that we can take out and put it Now, the laser might be more tricky because of the regulations, but most of the stuff that we've got is explosion proof. It's designed to actually be taken out to site. So, a lot of the work that we do is on a basis where we have this problem, you've got this toy. Come out and actually have a look at what's actually going on and process. And usually, what we'll tell them is, yeah, we can do that. Um, and by the way, you can do any sort of modeling or prediction or solving or whatever else with it. Sometimes, yes, sometimes no. But it does give us the ability to actually then showcase that we can actually do more than just take the images. Again, there's the cell and it's new. And again, yeah, so we have laser curtain that basically goes across that using the lasers and then basically using the CFD on the right hand side there to, to actually validate. This is one of our smaller lasers, and again, we can have a look at what happens in magnetic transports in 90 degree bends in real time. And some of the hydrodynamics, some of the experimental, proved pretty well um, the CFD, vice versa. Um, Hague systems, usually a problem. Um, we've got you know, lots of measurements that we can do in this case of solid extraction, so uh, real time. Um, we can actually measure that um, in situ. UT at UVP, um, again, very useful for knowing what's happening in regards to velocity gradients from the pipes. And again, this equipment is still deployable, and we use this a lot in the tunnels industry, so we'll come to that in a moment. And if you compare UVP against the CFD, again, again, they're pretty good. So the models actually, even though they're developed up, in the end, actually, can do it pretty well. Aggregate characterization using FBRM. Um, again, a lot of the work initially came out of the 266 project, but certainly the technique um, is, is, is broader than that, and we've got some really nice gear that basically allows us to measure the full length um, of problems and what happens with Fox in particular. And again, um, if we compare the actual prediction with validation, EIT, bits and pieces that sit here are actually part of the complete models, but EIT virtually could be applied to any piece of equipment, it doesn't necessarily have to be stationary, as you can see here. 
but it gives you an idea of what happens inside of your um, inside of any piece of equipment in regards to um, some of the hydrodynamics in particular. Uh, ERT, again, a fantastic way of actually working out the um, geese feature of do you have segregating flows? Do you have pockets where you get sliding bits of pipes as opposed to having a proper flow? Do you have um, areas that aren't mixing very well? Again, some comparisons, again, CFD, ERT. Again, we're trying to model whatever we actually try and measure. And then gamma attenuation, which I alluded to before. We've got it, uh, fixed pipelines that's over at Waterford, but we also have a transverse source that basically we can run up and down the pond to do things like sediment tests, um, looking at what happens to densities in, um, in systems where materials basically settle. Again, some of the key people is Krishna, um, who loves basically taking this type of equipment and finding new equipment and pushing it into the real mining industry, making it robust enough so it can survive in that space, but also having a look at um, how do you do the signal processing of that so that you can actually start thinking about how do you use that for control, how do you use that for um, feeding information back into operations so that you can start optimizing some of your spent a lot of time out on sites. William, again, um, absolute guru in putting these type of things, systems together, understands you know, some of the issues with regards to you know, that, um, some of the more problematic areas will basically go and see William and yeah, usually sort these things out for us. And uh, yeah, uh, particularly in the laser space. and sedimentation processes. Again, I'm going to go back to the FBRM. Um, that's a field probe that we can actually push out. Just a little bit about what FBRM does. Um, it does give you the um, ability to essentially just work out what your core lengths are around your particles. So not only good enough to, to try and uh, do obviously uh, particle sizing, mold, etc. But I think there's, there's a whole range of work that can be done much more accurate representatively if you don't assume everything to be spherical. Um, and we've used this on things like pipe reactors where we look at what happens if you inject polymers along the pipe. And in particular, the more field deployable the new ones that we've got, the past one of the problems was that this with the boroscope you would see multiple particles basically backing up on each other and you actually then do the image analysis. Things actually seem larger than what they are. Um, so you always get a larger particle size distribution than you should. Um, with the PV only actually a lot narrow. Um, so it's in theory and it is a lot more accurate. Gives you an idea of some of the pictures, uh, some of the things that we request to get out. And the new one basically again. So you get propagated aggregates is one of the things that we look at a lot. Block density analyzer. Um, again, I think this came out of the earlier stages of the P26. Um, but essentially, you can look at the whole range of things. There's heat and stages, and, um, you can do some selective population work. And the only thing is basically overflow studies was, was, was a big part of that. How do you, um, you know, work out what your certain rates are, and how do you maximize your spider positions? How do you um, look at where you, um, how you design your heat flow to basically prevent that, uh, the overflow of. Essentially, again, plan that we have a pretty state of the art laboratory. 
open space where we can measure, automate, and run a whole range of different things, different gases, um, temperatures, uh, multiple things that basically play about the plantation. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but I know that we're very interacting quite a lot with you guys in that space anyway. But uh, the milling time is actually pretty exciting to throw that in there. Um, it does actually allow you to have a little bit of a single bubble and see what happens um, in regards of um, how it attaches to that single bubble. And then basically we be able to use that um, to actually improve our safety in regards of how do we do the bubble attachment simulation in the safety. One of the other areas that may not necessarily be obvious to most is, is one of the um, opportunities we have in, in plate. Um, we have a really strong um, characterization group and selection scan microscope uh, characterizing a number of all the memory. Um, one of the things that you can do is basically do some in situ work. So you can actually look what happens to the different surfaces and um, while they're actually sitting in flotation substances. Um, so there's, there's a range of things that we can play around there. Memory boxes. Lisa Forbes, um, who back when she's in, in Cape Town, works with people like Dee uh, Bradshaw, actually Dee Bradshaw was her supervisor, who's just leading that area. This is one of the areas that we've identified that we want to be more active, which is physical flow modeling. So we have um, a rheologist that basically his pet area is in, is in the Nelmetonian area. So one of the things that I was talking about before was this inhomogeneous concentration profile. Um, so this is a cross section of the pipe, center line, and it does give you the ability of looking at velocities in the pipe. And one of the things that we can now do is work out this area that you can't see the angle um, on the probe. But essentially you can check whether you're getting a sliding bed or a static bed, so it's not moving at all, or whether you're getting um, you know, higher velocities on the higher part of the pipe. And we're currently in the process of getting that to a point where it's just to be robust. And you know, and sharing you know, complex thing, materials or logically um, Newtonian or Newtonian it is a challenge and it's an area that you know, we spend a lot of time looking at nowadays. This used to be our pipe loop. It's now been relocated and I'll show you a photo at the moment. But essentially the pipe loop very heavily instrumented um, with lots of new channel work with it. Um, but essentially it allows us to go from totally vertical to totally horizontal over a 20 minute span. So it's quite a beast. Um, and so you can see what happens in the pipe over a whole range of angles, whether you're pumping slurries, whether you're pumping any sort of fluids. Um, you can basically see what's happening in that size. So I think the largest pipe that we've run on that is 150 mm. So it's a decent size. A lot of expectation around pipe pundits, so we can do a lot of characterization work. And what happens is this like typically our instrument that we need from laser to ERT, we can see it to um, UVDP, um, which is the image I showed you a moment ago, MEMS. Um, so, yeah, there's a whole whole range of things that we've made by some in there too, but that's obviously not showing it's a pipe to the But uh, there's a whole, whole range of things that we can basically do with that characterized flow from the pipe loops. And this pipe loops is just one of that. The final one I'm going to, I think the second final one I think is, is the erosion minimization. Um, again, it's part of the group that used to sit out in Hyde and it's currently being relocated. We do a lot of erosion work um, and look at, you know, uh, again, trying to actually predict what happens in that space. This is an example of where um, vortex erosion around a pin, particularly in the back of the image, it's a bit away, um, can actually be a lot worse than the natural direct impact. And again, we do quite a bit of modeling around that. Um, and then the CMC. Seen uh, basically just to validate what we're actually modeling in the actual sector. Similarly, you know, vortex erosion, we had a particular client who had issues that they were getting holes in the joint of their tears. Um, why? Of course, the whole issue at the expected point of being um, purely by the way this is played out. Here's the example. So, uh, again, these holes are basically boring in the bottom of these. It's a PD receiving from later and again, causing all types of problems. Jay Wu, who's been working that field for a long, long time, um, is, is basically the person that leads that area out. So with that, I want to start 
winding up. Um, again, this is what I started with. The focus is really around the measurement simulation. Um, so mainly from all based flows, we do do simple flows as well. But uh, the majority is about the complex problems and then you solve all the separation processes. And these are kind of the areas that I hope we can give you some of the areas that we work on. And uh, thank you very much for having me. This, is, this, by the way, is the tool group. It also has been really handed out to the plate. It's not commissioned yet. It's still a trip to the side. But the actual bed sticks out further than that, so it actually goes higher. So we can go over the full stone and actually be running. So we can adjust the height of this all the way up, um, which gives us a different amount of energy to, to see what happens in the climate. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much for this presentation. And um, I would like to start with the questions. Actually, I would like to say that uh, after seeing the presentation, um, I see lots of potential collaborations and I think Malcolm and Peter here as well and uh, it would be really good for us as a university uh, to, say, to engage uh, new students and to come and share ideas uh, with you and uh, potentially use some of the fancy equipment that you have and we would like to share our toys as well <laughs> if possible so I definitely see uh, a new potential for collaboration between SMI and, and JK Center in particular uh, so I would like to welcome everybody else to uh, ask uh, questions. Yes, um, you mentioned that with mineral sand you use traces to monitor the, the flows. I'm just wondering what, what sort of traces do you use? Good question, I'll take one of those. <laughs> um, no, sorry, I can't say that directly, but um, Again, I'd probably ask the person that actually does it. This, that work was probably done four or five years ago before I actually was leading up that group. But I know that they do quite a bit of work in space to, to actually see what happens in the future process. But yes, I'll certainly help. I'll put you in contact with somebody who will be able to answer that question. Uh, right back at the initial one, you uh, determined that there had to be mining. Have you guys done any work on in situ? Processing of minerals, where has that been done in the organisation? <laughs> um, in situ is one of the three areas, I don't know if you can ask what the three areas um, It's one of the three areas that have been identified as new and development areas that we need to actually get involved in. Um, we have done some work all the way to, you know, to do the life cycle analysis and showing some of the benefits and trying to get some understanding of being able to articulate what the benefits are as well, so that for the environmental community side of it. I think we're, from memory, only now starting to actually look at, okay, what do we need to do in regards of funding and resourcing that area. Now, we'll probably sit under that strategic that third area, um, and Keith Barnard, who heads up that group, will be working in that space. But that's not to say that I think ultimately we have areas where we do fund things that have, at this stage, no industry direct engagement, but we do some fundamental work that is there actually an area. And that's one of the areas that we identified for our country to explore. So it's a trilogy in particular. Now, I mean, we've seen it in uranium, we've seen it in some of the other areas, but whether we can roll it out more broadly, and it's obviously this, it's driven by a whole range of factors of why people carry down the direction other than just necessarily cost. Um, really across the whole value chain. So, so it's not only in my area, but it's also the exploration part all the way down to the community environment part. Um, I'm wondering, there, there's been some interesting work that's obviously come out of the CSIRO and DEM modelling. Um, is that done within your group as well, or is that um, the DEM modelling of milling and, and crushing and stuff like that? Okay. Um, <coughs> A lot of the CFD guys and, and a lot of the computational guys moved across into minerals. There is still another group that sits still within mathematics and in the fundamental area, people like uh, Paul Cleary, etc., who 
who work in this space, um, who work pretty closely with us. So we, Peter Witt and Paul, be pretty much on a regular basis catching up and doing this type of work. And I've had this discussion before, there's no reason we can't tap into it at any time we want to attach to develop things up. And I had him in my office probably about two weeks ago talking about exactly that. It was there some areas and it was more around tailings because it also does tailings down tail work. Um, you know, where we could potentially be working on them. So Paul, Paul's keen to develop work in that space. Um, it's just a question of what's the mechanism to actually collaborate. Um, and obviously there's, there's, there's some legacy things that we need to work through. But I think you know there's no reason why you know, under the new system, you know, I say about new system, in, in the past when we had the major system, you had to be allocated, so everybody was chasing used to be allocations. So we one of this project, one six of this project. We try to release that a little bit by not having that system, and now basically providing we meet our external earnings target, everybody's paid for. So whether you are 100% allocated against the project or not is no longer quite so critical. It's more around what are you doing with that other 40% that you're not being allocated for? Can you actually do some collaborative work with somebody with that? Because we're repaying. Right, so it's not necessarily that whole hunger about we were spending a lot of time trying to work out where we're going to get our money from for the project. Now we've gone, okay, yes, we do need the projects, and we do need to meet our external target, and we do need to have that approach. Our biggest customer still government. So we still need to get that right. But whatever the remaining time is, the, the research themselves, by and large, can dictate what we can, can sort of guide what they want to be working on. And again, as long as it fits in with the general principles, most group leaders have actually said these are things we want to be doing. Um, as long as it fits in with that, and that comes from the situ which comes into milling, it comes in a whole bunch of stuff. Because milling is like that could be nutrient itself or something we don't do. <coughs> but it doesn't mean we don't do well in that space, and it doesn't mean that we can't do online sensing in that space, for instance. So ERT would be one of the candidates that we were discussing before we can actually put it onto a wall. So those things are, are things that we could collaborate on. But we don't want to buy a wall. I don't want to actually develop all that stuff up. You guys got that. All we want to do is demonstrate techniques that we can actually use and work. The mechanism of how to do that is a bit more challenging. Thanks, Thanks for the update again. It reminded me a lot of things you spoke about a couple of months ago. The, uh, you've got lots of work in thickening and pace pumping and that you've done over the years. Does it go spe specifically to the application of water recovery? So, what you can do to maximise water recovery or recycle back into the processing plant? There's two drivers, and again, we'll try to put the puzzle together on this probably about a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, but there's more two drivers essentially in tailings in particular, or water recovery, which kind of those links. Is one of them, yeah, some people want to do water recovery, other people want to reduce their footprint. Um, some mines are now basically reaching the maximum size that they have the tonnage facility, and so it's currently set on a hydraulic dam, and we'd like to turn that into a higher concentration, we call it steep tonnage, but a higher concentration to cover more of the water. It's the question of, particularly, you know, in Latin America, Latin America or South America, they're particularly worried about their water. Um, yet, I can't see the move actually being made yet to actually try and do a lot about that and try and recover or the effect of recovering that water back into the circuit because it's fairly to say, okay, well, we'll just pump back to the front end, but where it had the effect that it has on the chemistry, the effect that it has on everything else is, yeah, not insignificant, and I don't think has actually been good solved yet, that is. So, um, look, I think, again, as part of what we do and collaborate and think is, there is work that we could do, for instance, what is the <coughs> size or grind size effect on what happens to the thing that we need. I know that's one of the proposals that we Mm -hmm. up is, you know, does that mean it's easier to recycle? Does it mean it's harder to recycle? Should the theory of the stuff settle down quicker? Should it break? Probably not. There's going to be other issues. So those things are things that we could potentially look at and are outside of you know, the things that are tied up in the mire. But yeah, we are actively doing water recovery and also footprint of tailings, reducing tailings footprint on two areas of active Most of the process measurement seem to be all physical and it's only short time spent. Do you do any of the longer and more of the chemical or mineral uh, reaction, kinetics, interactions with the flows? Not yet. Where, where would that be? CSRX is strong. Uh, yeah, we have online measurement that would be in 
that second program that was there where basically we see what's the variation on um, you know, all grade, what's the variation, how does it affect things downstream. Um, uh, how do we blend in so I think that sits in essentially the, the second program. Um, and again, I'll be in contact with people who, who do that. Normally, I think they're based up at Luke's Heights, um, traditionally, and I think it's purely because of access to fast neutron and what we want from those things up there. So it's, it's one of the things that, you know, again, I know that we work for that space, but it's not something that I'm necessarily at price because it's way out from, geographically way out from the side, way out from my area. But again, again um, everybody now has a little bit of a different attitude in regards to the collaboration.